afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to our lunchtime seminar. Normally, we have a very long, well, a substantive bio uh, to introduce our speaker. But when I was talking to Professor Samru, he said, just, just say Professor Samru. <laughs> you know? So, so today we have Professor Brinsley Samru, Professor Emeritus of History from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. He's going to talk to us today about women's labor in the post-slavery era. So please, let's welcome Professor Samru. <coughs> Right. Thank you very much, Deborah. Yeah, let me say that <clears throat> don't don't accept anything. I mean, whatever I'm saying as, as as final. It's the result of ongoing, very painful research. I wish I didn't have to do this kind of of, of research, but then <clears throat> there we are. First of all, I want to say it is uh, an error to separate Indian from African women's experience from the time of slavery to 2003, <clears throat> when the sugar industry was closed down. The transfer from slavery to emancipation to indentorship, and that emancipation, that is from indentorship in 1920, was only a change of chains for women, a change of chains. There are many similarities between, between both of these experiences, that is women in slavery and in dentorship and afterwards. Both of, in, in both instances, the women were <clears throat> subjected to the European practice of segregation by day and integration by night. And that is something that starts in slavery and continues in indentorship. And I found from talking to people, continues after, continued after 1920. Throughout slavery, and uh, women were primarily involved in field labor, and the same was the case in indentorship. In both instances, the accommodation was the same. That is the barracks, or as they call them in Guyana, the logies, which uh, were situated athwart the plantations. In fact, when the Indians <coughs> started coming here from 1845, large numbers of Africans were evicted, women, men, children, were evicted from those barracks to accommodate the Indians, triggering off a, you know, a, an, an enormous conflict that <coughs> existed for long afterwards. During slavery, women had to multi multitask. Men had it, uh, were allowed to drink. And <clears throat> quite often in the estates, which I have found, particularly from my work in the indentured period, is that when a man worked hard, either as a slave or as an indentured man, he was given a bonus at the end of, of, of the season. But more often than not, that bonus was in rum. Rum, glorious rum. When I call you, you bung to come. It was made from Carony Cane, from Carony to Port of Spain. I go send my scorpion to bite your son to be. That, that rum was was a, a bonus, an incentive, and then the men, therefore, were, <coughs> were um, encouraged to drink and to laze afterwards. And the women, of course, had to go home to a second day's work with all kinds of household duties. Um, if, we, if, if, if we look at the experience, the socialization of Indian women, Indian <clears throat> girls from the time they were young, and this continues up to the present time, were socialized into multitasking. If you think of the goddess Lakshmi, we see Lakshmi all the time, and she's emerging from the dark primeval ocean on the Kumut, the lotus, and she has many hands. 
she has many hands. If you wonder afterwards, I could tell you what these various hands mm -hmm. indicate. But the symbolic message in, in Lakshmi is that she can do many things. Many things. So when you're praying to Lakshmi, you're asking for all kinds of boons because of her many hands. If you, if you ever go to um, just by, by the temple in the sea there before, there's a very big 85-foot uh, statue of Hanuman. Two hands. Two hands. One hand, one hand up there, which is the hand of peace, the hand of peace. I come to you in peace. And if you look at the left hand, there's an enormous club, an enormous club, which Mr. Satmaraj wields when he's having his program. Yeah? Mukta. There's a Mukta in his left hand, at his right hand, I come to you in peace. But if you mess with me, see what I have down here? I have the Mukta. That's, that's, that's the, the male Indian image of a man like, like ordinary people, two hands, and you don't expect them to do too many things if they only have two hands, but not, 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 not the women deities. So that Indian women from India in the Caribbean, and I'm saying up to the present time, are supposed to, 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 to multi multitask. Um, the men can go and, and loll off after a drink, rum and so on, but the woman has to go home to a second day's work in indentorship and afterwards as in slavery. The Indian woman was supposed to be like Sita, chaste, obedient, upholding Indian honor. But 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 those who those who, who preach that kind of doctrine fail to take advantage of, 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 of the fact that the Indian women, woman in indentorship and afterwards was not like Sita. She didn't have the protection that Sita had when she was um, abroad in, in Lanka. She had Ram and Hanuman and a whole host, a whole army of monkeys to, to defend her. Indentured women the indented woman, like the slave woman before her, before her, had no such protection on the ship, sailors, cleaners, guards. And then once she had come to the Caribbean on the plantation, managers, overseers, contractors, clerical staff. In 1934, when there was well, possibly the biggest of the various uprisings in 1934. We're talking about 24th of July, 1934. The uprising was sparked by a very offensive, I mean, I, I know what it was, but I wouldn't say it, a very offensive remark about women who, who were gathered by Mr. Gilbert, who was a manager of Brecon Castle. And it is that, that very offensive remark to the women who were in, 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 in front of the Brecon Castle estate that sparked off a very considerable uprising on the 24th of July, 1934. And, and I was very pleased to read that Mr. Gilbert, they said Mr. Gilbert had to escape from the, the large band of women and men through a back door. He had, he had to break open a window and escape through the back such was the affection that they had for Mr. Gilbert. And we, of course, pay tribute to Mr. Gilbert now. If you go half an hour away from St. Augustine, there's Gilbert Park, right there, right there. Gilbert Park, named after this, this, this miscreant. So in, in the same way that the Europeans fail to appreciate the African way of seeing, and therefore suppressed uh, religious views that the Africans brought to the Caribbean, such as Shango, Stroke, Orisha, as well as Islam, which Africans brought to the Caribbean. It wasn't brought by Indians, it was brought by Africans. But the reason why there's so little known about the introduction of, of Islam by Africans is that the Europeans suppressed it. They failed to understand what the Africans had brought either by way of traditional African faith or 
um, African Islam, which was brought to the Caribbean. And similarly, Indian religious philosophy, Indian ontology, was, was, was not taken into consideration. Indian men did not want to marry outside of the race for very profound religious reasons. I won't go into it now, you could ask me afterwards why it is that Indian men continuously refrained from uh, marrying African women. Um, and I'm saying that, that, that that's, that's because of, of, of a, a deep-grained philosophical premise. So if you tie that, that, that philosophical premise with the constant paucity of Indian women, we see what a volatile situation is created, a mixture of, of violence and murder um, coming as a result of the, of the Indian male um, desire not to cohabit outside of the race. The Europeans refused to recognize non-Christian marriages <clears throat> until 1935 for Muslims and 1945 for Hindus. And I find, I find that that is one of the very painful areas that I have to research because there were hundreds of Indian women, Hindu and Muslim, who were deprived of property that their spouses had left. And, and, and you know, I've seen so many accounts of, of the French Creoles in particular who had inside information and knew that Sigulam Maharaj or Afzal Muhammad had died, and he would simply go and tell the woman, this five acres and this cattle, and that, that's mine. She said, w what the hell, what is yours? We were properly married. We, we, had, we had a good nikah and the wedding lasted. He said, no, 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 madam. You were not legally married. So that estate is no mine, that plantation, uh, that homestead. And so hundreds of Indian women, uh, Hindu and Muslim, were deprived of property. And, and so many of them had to farm out the children, farm out the children. The woman had to run back by her father. Uh, and, and they were poor. They couldn't take everybody. So the children are farmed out. There are so many examples of this uh, in the history of Trinidad and, and, and Guyana, which I have, have um, encountered. So women and children were particular victims of, of that kind of illegal law that, 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 that operated. It was not until 1948 that non-Christian educational institutions were recognized by the state and, and scheduled for state assistance, whereas let us say with the Presbyterians, it was from the 1870s and they were constantly given grants. 1945, and the very first school to be recognized, non-Christian school, is El Socorro Islamia. And of course, once that, 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 that lead had been set, from 1952, the Mahasabha comes on stream, and, 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 and that's a, another story. So I just want to make a, a few comments on the, on the philosophy behind um, women as laborers, why, why, why should women, why could women, why were so many of them required to be laborers? In 1834, slavery was abolished in India, at which time there were hundreds of Indian slaves in Mauritius, along with African slaves. In 1834, now that uh, slavery is abolished in India, the first batch of indented Indians go to Mauritius, there to join you know, other Indians who had preceded them, but as slaves, not as indented laborers. And the experiment worked well in Mauritius, that is bringing Indians from India to Mauritius. That is said, well, we could extend it to the Caribbean and that is why four years afterwards, that is in 1838, the Hesperus and Whitby 
bring two shiploads of Indians to Demerara. The proportion of Indian women to men in indentorship was by and large, well, roughly the same as that during slavery. In 1838, William Gladstone, large slave owner in Demerara, who had uh, large plantations, he owned a lot, a lot of slaves in Guyana, and now he decided that uh, slavery was abolished, he was going to, 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 to move to Indians. And that's why the Indians, the first Indians who go down to Guyana, are called Gladstone Coolies. And what was the directive that Gladstone gave to his agents in Calcutta? One female for cooking and washing is enough for every 10 Indian men. One female. So the only need that Indian men had then was for cooking and for washing, so far as he, is con he was concerned. And that became the standard, and that lasted for a considerable period. The plantation system, both in slavery and in dentship, saw people as commodities, not as humans with feelings and beliefs. Now, why is it that, 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 that women in indentorship they were not considered a priority. Well, for a number of reasons. First of all, there was always an abundance of unemployed, let's say, laboring men in India. And if we could fill this, this gap left by, by the flight from the plantations after slavery, and fill this gap with, with men, and there is no dearth of such men in India, why do you have to bring women? In fact, women would be a hindrance. Women would be a hindrance to production because of pregnancy and child rearing. Therefore, there was a continuous disproportion. Right down, well, I was going to say right down to 1891, but from 1891 the situation improves. So it, it's, it's continuous, but it gets greater from uh, the, the, the proportion becomes the disproportion becomes less from 1891. These two ships that land three days apart from each other in Guyana in May 1838, about 400 people, 400 indentured laborers, among whom were 14 women and 11 girls. That's about 10 percent. The Fat Al Razak that comes to Trinidad in 1845, 129 males, 29 females, about 13%. So generally, one can say that the proportion of women to men hardly uh, get more than 33% up to the 1880s. From 1891 to about the 1917, it is roughly about 45 percent, still you know less, but but an improvement from um, the earlier situation. Indentorship mu mu must not be seen as 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 all gloomy. Indentorship had positive sides. Indian women. <clears throat> in the areas to which they went, found a new liberation from the restrictions of India. One can say that cultural stereotypes are now disassembled. They are coming from a long created society, an ancient society with absolute certainties to a society in creation filled with uncertainties and this gives give them this gave them considerable room to move so the restrictions on caste were loosened the restrictions on 
communalism were loosened. In fact, in fact, the very first um, occasion when that breaking down of Indian custom takes place is 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 on the ship. And and on the on the ship throughout the period of Indian ship to whichever colony Indians went, there was created, well most of you would know the term the Jahaji Bai, Jahaji Bahin, and they walk with their Jahaji Bandal. Bandal is a Sanskrit word out of which we get the English word bundle. And of course, Mr. Jack Warner um, didn't understand that, so when he quarreled with Mr. Dukaran, he said, you take your Georgie bundle and go. Georgie bundle, we said Georgie bundle because, you know, we have lost the, 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 the word and its meaning. The proper term is the Jahaji bundle, in which they, they, they brought, you know, so many different things from, from India to, to wherever they went. But, um, you know, on, on, on that ship, that, that, that bond, that bond was created during a long voyage of normally three months so that, so, that, so that Indians forever afterwards remembered who their Jahaji Bais and their Jahaji Bahins were. Children of, children of Jahaji Bais and Bahins could not marry, could not intermarry because they, they considered the bond so, so intimate so that there, there were many instances when two children or grandchildren of, of Jahaji Bhais or Jahaji Bhain wanted to get married, the elders stepped in and, and just stopped it because that is your Jahaji Bhai relationship and you, 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 you can't get married. So, so caste bonds and communal bonds are, are, are relaxed and this of course continues on the, on the, on the estates, on the plantation. So now there are lots of intercaste and intercommunal families, liaisons and so on taking place. And as I said earlier on, Indian men were most reluctant to marry out of the race. So, so when they married out of the race, they would marry out of the caste and indeed out of the religion. Indian women could now increasingly engage themselves in non-caste occupations because in India um, casteism was and is is so strong that you you are virtually tied to, to a caste occupation for for your whole life so if I went to, to have a shoe ordered in the in the city of Delhi and the fellow would just look at my foot and say you come tomorrow and say who oh, can you look at my foot you don't take any measurement <coughs> He said, we have been in this for the last 300 years, you know. So I don't have to, I just look at your foot. And when you go the next day, the shoe fits absolutely. Because, because the, the, these caste occupations go on for, for centuries. Um, now all of these things are, are, are broken down. And there is considerable freedom to go into all kinds of, of other occupations. To, to, to areas which... which you know the caste, um, you know, not no prohibited, did not did not intervene. The question of the bride price, the dowry, now becomes irrelevant because women, you know, women, now have a, a high currency in that situation. And one of the things that, that I find in looking at labor history is the increasing tendency of women in indentorship and afterwards to go into task work rather than day work. There is a difference in the two. Um, in indentorship, let's say a man would get 25 cents a, a day. A woman, women and what you call weekly men, women and weekly men would get 15 cents. So that, so that there was this wage differential but increasingly one finds women now opting for task work on, on par with men. So you give me, you give me this task, give me one task, two tasks, and, and, and pay me for that. So they sought to increase their income by, by demonstrating their capability 
to, to compete with the men um, in, in, in taking on task work and thus avoiding the, the very clear discrimination of, 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 um, of day work. And this was, this was particularly um, important, this and, and, and the marriage situation for widowed women. And I would say about 15% of, of the women who came to the Caribbean were widowed women who would have taken a very bold leap forward um, to escape from India. And if they had stayed from India, their fate would have been very terrible. I won't go into that, but I'll simply refer you to um, Sea of Poppies, Sea of Poppies by Amitabh Ghosh. Very painful reading, but 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 that's a book that 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 it comes out of considerable um, research that Ghosh did. So 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 rather than escape, you know, being on the cremation pyre in India or you know all such very degrading practices. They, they, they opted, as I said, about 15% of them came to the, uh, well, came to the various countries which took indented persons. So let me talk briefly, let me talk briefly about some of the events and persons. And I want to talk, um, well, about 1934 in a little bit of detail because I think that's, that's important. And I'll skip over 37 just with some comments and then go over to 19. 75, which are three important areas, three important dates. 1934, the sugar belt is in crisis. There's a particularly bad dry season in that year, and there's no reduction in the tasks that are being given to the workers, men or women. As I said, uh, women were, were equally numerous uh, as laborers. We are still looking at the delayed effects of the Great Depression, the after effects of the Great D Depression. And we are looking at a period in which the plantations are having a field day since there is no trade un there are no trade unions. The trade union trade union movement comes into being in 1937 as a result of the stri strikes and disturbances. Of course, if you, if you are reading the history of this period, you will see that they said in 1932 there was a law allowing for trade unions. Well, that law was, 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 was like a non-law because you couldn't pick it, you couldn't go on demonstration, and you couldn't sue the employer for actions in tort. So if, if you can't sue for actions in tort, and you can't vote, tell me, how can you have? So you know, you had um, you had so-called trade union as the condensed condensed milk sellers trade unions and and so on, what kind of church union? Because um, the trade union movement was was totally toothless, and it would have hardly come in into being in the way that it did, had it not f but for the disturbances of 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 1937. Now, what is the what was the attitude? What was the attitude of the plantation system um, to 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 women? And, and and I would I would refer you to a very important uh, document, which those of you who are working on this should read. Read as a report of Surgeon Major D. W. Cummins. He was he was a senior civil servant, protector of immigrants in in, in India in the Calcutta office. So and he knew Hindi very well. So he was sent to, to Trinidad, 1891, to look at, at, the, at, at the conditions on the estates. So I'll, I'll just read from Surgeon Major Cummins. Women should be put to work so as to encourage habits of industry. So let us go back to the word industry. Let us go back to the word the origin, the Sanskritic origin of the word industry. When uh, 327, Alexander the Great uh, and his entourage came to 327 BC, came to India and, and, and he was moving southwards, he came to the Indus, Indus River. 
where he found the men, you know, you know, so the men and them too lazy, they only want the rock. Men and them were lolling over, and the women were working. What's the Sanskrit word for women? Stri. Stri, women working on the Indus industry. Mm -hmm. And here we have, here we have Mr. Cummins using the exact word without knowing the origin of the word that women should be put to work so as to encourage habits of industry. In, I, I'm breaking up the words. Um, and then he goes on to say, there is little fear that when work is plentiful and good wages are to be obtained, that the husband will not allow her to sit idle. I mean, could you believe that? I'll read that again. There is little fear that when work is plentiful and good wages are to be obtained, that the husband will not allow her to sit idle. And the woman must be made to work. There must be, in other words, housework is no work, it's idle work. So they can't be sitting down idling at home, looking after children and cooking and washing and so on. The, the, the husband, he was pleased to say this, will not allow her to sit idle. So there's a kind of double jeopardy under which Indian women are operating. There's that, there's that Indian uh, philosophy, that Indian point of view that the woman should be Lakshmi, you know, a doer of everything, a multitasker, tasker, whereas the, the man, he has, the God has two hands and, well, men can't be expected to do too much anyway. Combined with Victorian patriarchy, combined with Victorian patriarchy, which they meet in this, in this Western Christian environment. So there's, so there's that double jeopardy. So let us, let us talk about, about the July uprisings of 1934. When I said it's a particularly bad dry season, the, the, the planters refused to raise wages and so on. 6th of July, warden's office outside of Kuva. Arrests of 12 women and men. There are about four women from when I look at the thing and about eight men who are arrested because they, 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 they're parading outside of the warden's office um, on the 6th. On the 9th of July, 2,000 laborers, sugar workers, and a particular group that the report picks up domestics. Domestics. These would normally be black women who join with, with the Indian men and women. About 2,000 of them uh, parading in, in Shagwanas, parading in Kuva. In fact, one of the reports says that the women were in the lead, the women were in front because they had reached a situation in which, um, you know, they, 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 it was quite intolerable. And a number of the women from, from that cohort of about 2,000 in Shagwanas and Kuva were arrested and taken to Shogonas and imprisoned. And it is only when the men saw their wives, their sisters, their mothers in prison that the men decided to join um, <coughs> and be arrested because they couldn't leave the women by themselves. See, that is the, that's a contradiction of, of the culture. So, so, so the, men, the men joined subsequently. Uh, but, but the women were the ones who gave the lead. 23rd July 1935, 34, sorry. Esperance Estate, where weeders and drainers, and I'm co uh, quoting from the official report, weeders and drainers urged by the woman, urged by the woman, and then the, the whole mob attacked them with bamboo sticks, hose, and other implements. That is the quotation. And so the two white overseers, Mitchell and Dougal, <laughs> were pulled off their horses, pulled out of their horses. And both the men and the women joined in giving them 
a sound beating. When the owner of the estate, Sir Harold, well, not, he was Harold Robinson, later on they made him Sir Harold. Um, Harold Robinson came to, to, to talk to the people, to talk to the people, to his workers, those are his workers, those are his virtual slaves. There are two women, one of whom is Sug Barsi, Sug Barsi, and her colleague, Eddie Charles. Mm -hmm. I do not think Eddie Charles would have been an Indian woman. Um, confronted, confronted the, the owner, that was the employer. <coughs> you don't confront your employer like that. Arguing with him about the size of the tasks. They were, they were saying that the, that the size of a task is 25 rods. He was saying, no, no, you are wrong, it's 22 rods. And they said, no, you are lying, we could take you and measure. So these were men were confronting him. And when he asked them, what, in your view, is a reasonable size for a task? They said, 12 rods, which was reasonable in view of the, the dryness of the season, the hardness of the land, and so on. On the 24th of July, there are peaceful demonstrations by large numbers of men and women. Some of the newspaper reports said there were more women than men. 24th of July, Tanapuna here, women who worked, women and men who worked in the Orange Grove Estate, Shaguanas, Claxton Bay. <coughs> the commission report says in Tanapuna there were 200 women with babes in arms. They came with their children, pleading for some kind of sustenance in that um, particular time. This woman pleaded with us to make the task reasonable, since she has three children to support. And then on the 24th of July, also, word gets around of the, of the strikes um, throughout, throughout Central, well, let's say from, from, from here, from the East West Corridor here, right down to Central. At Brecon Castle, all sections and all classes, men and women, assembled before the office. That is before the office, that, that, that's still there, that's still there if you go to BC. And, and that is when, I mean, when they approached Gilbert, he made an extremely obscene remark to the women who were at the, the front. And once this was conveyed to, to the people, behind, well, all hell broke loose. All hell. Oh, Lord. Yeah, yeah, so, <coughs> all right. Yeah, so, so you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk for five minutes again. I have to stop, but we can continue afterwards on some subsequent occasion. Right, so, um, more than a thousand people, more than a thousand people, men and women, gather outside of, of Brecon Castle. And that is when I think, you know, the name that, that you found out, Naidu, the woman Naidu, she is a leader there. But that indicates that the women were, were, had, had an idea of, of Naidu, Sarojini Naidu, who was a freedom fighter in India. So the information had got here. So this woman, who might be nameless as to her real name, she is called Naidu, because, because she, she is associated with, uh, with, with what happened in India. So this is the first phase of the struggle, continuous um, movement, continuous rebellion throughout the month of July. And that leaves, that leaves us straight to 1937, in which, of course, the women join with the men behind Butler and Rienzi. And just as an aside, I would say that, in my own estimate, that's the best example of Afro-Indian solidarity that we have ever had in, in, in Trinbago. I don't think it has occurred you know, as strongly as occurred at that time, any time afterwards. Right, so, so um, okay, I, 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 wouldn't go, I wouldn't go into it. We don't have time. I'll, I'll take. But let, let, let me just end up by, by so, so, so 1937 is very important, and possibly we could talk about it afterwards. And in 1975, when the state takes over Kearney, 
there's a serious uh, conflict in the sugar areas for for leadership between all Trinidad Sugar Estates and Factory Workers Union and Shah's Union, which is IC, FTU, all Trinidad, um, I, um, Island White Cane Farmers Trade Union. And, and, and Shah gets particularly strong support from women in Barakpur. So I'll just tell you the same, Clara Panchu, single mother of five and a cane farmer. And so, 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 so there's a lot of agitation, strike, strike tent in Barapur, Bonaventure, 50 women leading the sugar workers day and night camp in um, Bonaventure. <clears throat> and out of that, out of that struggle, January 1975, that, that uh, the, 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 the sugar companies decide to give equal pay to women, equal pay for equal tasks. And just to talk about one or two of these women, Dora Bridge Mohan, 1936 or 66. You could ask me about half to us, Sahid and Ramro. These are women I, I knew very well. Um, so, so, so we could talk a little <coughs> bit about their, their involvement. So just, just, just to conclude, conclude that there is very little difference in the treatment of women in slavery, in dentiship, and afterwards. In the post-slavery era, a deliberately created structural inequality is put in place to ensure maximization of labor, but equally to ensure devaluation of women's labor. Uh, and this devaluation is not only of sugar workers, not only of Indian women, but of women across the board. Women were not blindly and obediently accepting this artificial degradation, and so they struggled. These two women I spoke about, Elma Francois was involved also with them in these struggles, Naidu in 1934. And, and the recent activists, as I said, um, Dora Bridge Mohan, um, Olsi Bagan, Stella Abid. Stella Abid. You know, I'm not elaborating this because I don't have time. So I will end, end here and, and um, open it up for some debate. But certainly we are, we are incomplete and, and I'd like to, to continue or to elaborate on this because I just, I just ran through um, the, the section after 34. Thank you, Dr. Sam. We have much food for what we have, Stella Abed, Sahida Ramu, Bridge Mohan, Clara Panchu, Suparsi, and Eddie Charles. Um, Professor Samru has really given us interesting things of phrase like segregation by day and integration by night. Uh, so we're opening up the floor to uh, questions, some comments, but preferably questions. I remember, we have an explored post 1937 a lot, and I think Professor Samuel has something to say about that. So, any questions? Mm -hmm. Welcome, Professor. I'm interested in uh, Indian women's uh, political priorities in the labor movement in the earlier, earlier 20th century. And if we could speak about that, where, what were the departures from men at the time? How did they conceptualize solidarity with Africans? Was it any different from Indian men? Was there a certain type of engagement? Mm -hmm. So I just want to know how did they conceptualize labor for their issues as Indian women, but also how they identify the political priorities? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me say. I mean, from my reading, that 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 that, that the women did not racialize the conflict. They saw they saw other women as other oppressed people. And as I said, the women were right at the at, at the bottom of the scale. So I didn't notice, you know, too much of a, of of separate agitation in in thirty four, in thirty seven, and 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 again, let's say when when they gathered here in Tonopuna or at Brecon Castle, it was it was you know a very mixed gathering. So I mean, 
to give you a short answer, they did not they didn't make any any difference and and the women you know became very active very actively involved in in the politics of the period let us say for example Sahidan Ramro she was the agent up here she was Pandey's agent for this whole northern area she lived in what was now Twin City and and, and she worked in Orange Grove and she was it's a foreman woman but foreman and and, and she had both Africans and Indians, men and women, following her strongly. That's one of the things that, that, that impressed me because this, this was a mixed area and yet her follower, following was not Indian, Indian men, Indian women, but, but everybody, everybody in, in this um, mixed area, Tonapuna, Orange Grove, that, that's sort of thing. Yeah, we please. have a question from our, uh, somebody who's watching on the Facebook Live, and he said that you mentioned Dora Bridge Mohan. Can you elaborate more about her contribution as a woman to the cane fields and her eventual entry into the Senate and what it meant for other women in the cane fields? Right. <clears throat> yeah, well, like I could speak about Dora Bridge Mohan because I, I, I knew her quite well. The years of her life, 1936 to 1966, she was a cane cutter. She was a cane cutter since the age of 20. And the particular estate, I'm saying cane cutting, that, that's like the most difficult part of, 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 of the, the, the show work. Cane cutting from 20, from the age of 20, at the Waterloo estate. And, 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 and therefore she, she, she understood very closely the, the experiences of women in, in that central area and very soon she emerged as, as a leader, as a leader among women in the, the whole area of, of Waterloo, take the whole of Waterloo, Felicity, that, that whole area. And therefore, and therefore when um, Mr. Pandey was, was looking for a woman, a woman sugar worker to put in the Senate in 1976, the whole community recommended Dora Bridge Mohan and, and, and that is how she was, she was appointed to, to the Senate. And in that Senate, she was in the opposition. There was considerable disquiet people fighting and quarreling among themselves all the time. And all the men, all the men who started off in 1976 were not there in 1981. All of them had been put out and new persons added. The only person who remained from 76 to 81 was Dora Bridge Mohan. As, as the UNC representative in, in, in the Senate because she didn't involve... U ULF? Yeah, yeah, in the US. She didn't involve herself in all the ULF promise yeah. and confusion. And, and she was, you know, virtually untouchable because she really represented the sugar workers and women very effectively in the Senate. I remember her telling me one day in the Senate that she couldn't read. She couldn't read when she got into the Senate. So she had her children. She had children who were in their 20s and their 30s who taught her to read and who read for her and wrote down things for her to say in the Senate. So she was truly a, a remarkable woman and, and an icon in the, in, the, in the Indian community. At the beginning of your talk, you said that um, on the whole, Indian men refrain from sexual relationships with African women for religious and cultural reasons, um, which I have no doubt is true. But just to remind people of the argument made by the young historian Audra Dipti, mm -hmm. she turns the argument around. And um, she's, she's writing mainly about the late 19th century. And her argument is that um, it is most unlikely that African women would have wanted such relationships, at least up to the early 1900s. Um, not only because of the cultural differences, which of course would have operated for the African women as well as for the Indian men, but because the vast majority of Indian men at that period, whether they were indentured or ex-indentured, were impoverished and had virtually nothing to offer canny African Trinidadian women. So just to remind us all that um, the women had agency too. 
So it's not just a matter that religion and caste and everything else um, prevented the Indian men from seeking such relationships, but that African Trinidadian women might not have been, with some exceptions, obviously, might not have been particularly receptive to, to that. Of course, of course, one can argue against that by saying that African women didn't have such an objection to marrying Chinese men, or vice versa. Because they could offer, the Chinese <laughs> men could, 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 offer, offer, could, offer, could mm -hmm. offer a lot more than an impoverished Indian cane cutter or mm -hmm. peasant mm -hmm. or peasant. I mean, that, that is a cynical, yeah, a cynical she gave no evidence. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, it's Audra Dipti, so know, she has written a very good article on this, which you could all look at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's a very arguable uh, yeah. point, a very very debatable point. But, but but let me just let me let me just for for one moment say why Indian men did not want to marry in non-Indian women. It has to do with uh, reincarnation. It has to do with an Indian belief in reincarnation. You are born and, 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 and life is circular. Life is circular. They don't see history in terms of, of a timeline, year one and year 10 and 1950. It's circular. And how you live, how you live in this life determines the new karma, the new reincarnation into which you, you are born. You would be born. And if you marry outside of that karmic circle, marry outside, then marrying outside breaks, breaks that whole continuum. It breaks the whole continuum. And therefore you, you are not assured that, that, that you know, your biogenetic memory, the you that has come over thousands of years, would, would continue. And, and, and that, was that, that, that was a profound reason why they didn't want to, to break that, that circular Chakra, that chakra, by by marrying outside. So, so, so that was the, um, the the philosophical point of view. conditions of enslavement were similar to indentureship. So I think at a broad level, yes, but I, I do think that, that one could really say they were the same. Maybe they, they were similar common yeah. principles yeah, yeah. that mm. govern them, but I, I think that it would be true to say that they were the same. Would you agree? You see, so for, for women I'm saying it was just a change of chains. Eh? A change of 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 change. I I, <clears throat> I I think it was the experience was was, was quite similar. The, the low esteem in which they, they were held, they in which they were just used used at will by men, you know, at all kinds of of levels. So I think I think for women it was just a, a continuum of an extremely bad experience mm -hmm. of an extremely bad, which is why Indian women and African women were able to to bond so closely afterwards um, in, in, in the 20th century because they, they understood that they were coming out of a similar trauma. But to follow up um, Rhoda's query, I think one of the profound differences between the experiences of enslaved women and indentured women did lie in the whole area of sexual exploitation. Now, of course, I am aware that some young indentured women um, were pressured or coerced into sexual relationships with you know, young overseers. But it was infinitely less common and it was far less sanctioned than the sexual exploitation of enslaved women by everybody, <laughs> by young overseers, by managers, by owners, by owners' sons, by powerful male slaves, yes, there were powerful enslaved men on the plantation. As we all know, if we know anything about slavery, um, during enslavement, this kind of sexual exploitation was utterly routine. 
nobody challenged it except a few eccentric missionaries who <laughs> might have been living in the Caribbean at the time. And those of us who have read materials like the Thistlewood Diary know yes. how completely routine and expected it, it was. During indenture, while it happened, it didn't have broad sanction. In fact, the colonial authorities and the estate managers tried to stop it because they knew very well that nothing riled up the indentured labor force as much as the young white men on the plantation interfering, that was the word that was always used, interfering with um, young indentured women. They tried to stop it. Um, so overseers were sometimes dismissed when the evidence was too flagrant, you know, that he'd been sleeping around with, with young indentured women. Um, so while it happened, it was on an infinitely smaller scale, and it didn't enjoy the kind of social sanction, the routinization mm. that had been the case in slavery. And I think that's a huge difference for the day-to-day -day lived experience uh, of the women in the two, system, in the two <laughs> different systems of unfree labor. question then we we are finished. Um, if anybody wants to go before me. Tell me about Stella Abbey. I think she stands out for some reason. <coughs> Stella Abbey. Mm -hmm. Yes yeah, she was she was the daughter of Charles Clarence Abid was a very prominent was a very prominent um, politician, a very prominent politician, and she was the first Indian woman to go abroad and come back qualified as a doctor. That is in 1934. Um, so she was she was she was toasted. She was, she was considered quite 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 an important person. And, and from the time she came, this, this is, you know, in my conversation with her, one of the things that, that she did, she went and went into public health. She could have gone and made a fortune by being a private doctor. But she didn't, and when I asked her why, she said she went to public health because she was particularly concerned about the condition of sugar workers. And she never worked in, in the north, but she concentrated her work in the south, going on all the sugar villages and so on. And she, so, so, so she had a, a special care for the, for the sugar workers and the people living in the sugar belt. And she was a particularly strong organizer of women, Indian women, um, taking up their causes. And for most of them, they didn't have any money when, when a petition had to be written, when these women and their children had to be looked after and so on. Um, so I think she was, she was a... She was truly a, a, a very noble person and very dedicated to to working among among Indian sugar workers. And then and then she told me the one advantage she had, she spoke Hindi very well, which I'd learned from her father. Um, later on, just as an aside, she she, she was very close to Adrian Kola Renzi. But 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 she, she was you know, quite a a vibrant woman leader. I have a question about Abid and Rienzi. I don't know if you want to be, you know, publicized, but, you know, recently, Adrian Kola Rienzi received the highest national award, and then it turned up on eBay. And <coughs> none of his family came to collect it, and clearly they, they had no interest in it. So apparently these children were sent to Canada. And that history of Rienzi clearly, I don't know what happened to it, but I was wondering what was so painful in that whole experience that resulted in this distancing from that whole rich history. Uh, yeah, yeah, because the, the, two, the two sons whom he had with, with Stella were illegitimate children. They were born while he was 
legitimately married to an English. Oh, he was married. Uh, that's, yeah, that's true. And he had he had two children with the English woman. And when when the scandal broke out about his liaison with Abid, she took her two children and went back to England. And 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 left and left. But neither could Renzi nor Abid publicly claim, publicly let the country know that these two boys are my children with so that both Adrian and Stella made sure that the boys one was exactly my age. He was educated in medicine in the University of Toronto. And Stella went up there and ensured that he got admission. And and the other one, the, the younger one, well he she ensured that, that he also was educated and, and he lived most of his life as a teacher. When the award was made to Renzi, I asked him to come over to Trinidad and receive it. But he said he's so broke. I told him he could stay with me because I knew him very well. He could stay with me, but he was so broke. He said, you'll have to pay my passage. He said he couldn't pay his passage to come to Trinidad because from Vancouver to Toronto and to Trinidad and back. So he couldn't pay the passage. And that is why it had to be received from him. And then upon his death, because he was married to a Ukrainian woman who, who really n never came to Trinidad and had no knowledge about Trinidad or about Renzi, <coughs> so she simply decided to sell it. Uh, and so it was bought by local people, and, and it's now here. So, but, but she really had no interest whatever in Trinidad, and she saw it as just a chance to make a quick buck. That, that's a sad story of, of, of that. So what uh, surname did they carry? Abid and Rianzi's son? Abid. They were both War, W-A-U-G-H. So a Canadian couple, Mr. and Mrs. War, took the, the, the first boy, and they were so pleased with him that when she had the second one, they said, yeah, 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 bring him. Right. But we don't have any children. So they adopted them, I They adopted them, so they were both Wars, and Adrian and Stella sent money uh, on a monthly basis to support the two boys. As I said, when the older one went for, for medical school in Toronto, Stella went back because UFT was her alma mater. She went back to ensure that the boy got in. And, and he became you know, a major physician for Trans World Airlines. He spent most of his world life working for Trans World Airlines until his his recent retirement. And, and the, other, the, the other lad, the one in um, Vancouver, he went and qualified, he qualified in, in music, in fact. Um, so he was a, a music teacher for, for most of his life in, in Vancouver. The, the legitimate children in Britain cut all ties with the Rienzi Party. Because they might have been the one, ones who could have come and accepted the mm -hmm. Trinity, or the whatever, the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Perhaps yeah. they just cut ties. Yeah, yes, they, they just, just cut ties, except, except for his, the oldest son, mm -hmm. who again Renzi supported when he was doing medicine in England. Mm -hmm. And that older son was cognizant enough to come and take one of Renzi's properties just <laughs> outside of Queen's Park, Savannah, <laughs> and, and sell it. Right. So he came and sold it and took off, which is why the other one, Bob War, from the other, he was very angry because he said the man take our father's property, and he sold it for millions, yes, outside of, of Queen's Park, Savannah, and didn't give the rest of us a cent. So that, so the, the, a sad story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a sad story, and it's not something I would, you know, want to write about, even though I have all the details of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so now I know. <laughs> So, Professor Samuel, on behalf of the IGDS, uh, like I was saying also that's well, it will get I know she's busy. On behalf of the IGDS, um, on behalf of all of us here, thanks a million for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, this is our last Wednesday seminar for this semester. So, in, at the end of September, please check your WhatsApp. What's up? Sorry. What's up? What's on? What's on? Sorry. What's on? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Ryder, please do what's on. What's on? <laughs> yeah.
Thanks again, Professor Sam.